Oh, it's amazing. I'm just blown away by that hue and thank you so much. That was uh, the love song of the Welsh Revival and that was uh, sung by very many. Well, let's resume where we were. Let's see if I can do this right, Jerry. That's it. Right. All set, fasten your seatbelts. This was the promise then he'd made to his mother. Oh, he hasn't taken this. Now that's strange, Jerry. It's not carrying. It's okay. All you have to do is just get out again and then go back in again. Just press escape. Yeah. Press escape. Or click on the uh, the top bar, top most bar, right at the yes. top. There. New share, new scheme. What's it say? Uh, Stop share and then go out and then come back. Oh, in. Yeah. I see. Right. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Sometimes it gets a bit sticky. Right. Mm -hmm. No. Right. Share screen. Yes. Should be all right this time. Well, then, I hope it moves. We'll, we'll try. Oh, no, it doesn't move, Jay. One more time. You, you go out and then come back in again. It's OK. Escape. I, I've, got, I've got it underneath. I can see the, the program. That's right, yeah. Try one more time. Share screen. Oh, yeah, now it's going. Okay, good. What a relief. Right, well, Evan, having shared what he's going to do, he's He's going to talk to the children after church. And that's the church on the right hand side. It's almost out of the picture. But the building next door was known as a schoolroom, and no doubt it was used for that purpose. It was good for Sunday school and small group teaching and stuff. And it's also known as the vestry. So he went up to his uh, minister, who was Reverend Daniel Jones, and he said, uh, Could I please have your permission to share what God has done with me? Uh, with the young people in this church after the end of Sunday service. Now, you know what ministers are. They tend to be very cautious people. And he said, well, he said, the ground is stony and the task will be hard, but you may do your best. And he didn't give him much chance, did he? But it wasn't his best that Evan Roberts was interested in. He knew that the Lord had told him to do this. So after the uh, afternoon ser evening service was finished, Evan Roberts went next door to see who would be there. This is the schoolroom. And actually, it was very disappointing in terms of the numbers. There were only 17 people there, and only one of them was a child. But nevertheless, Evan Roberts shared exactly what the Lord had done with him. And the following night, it was every night he was doing this, there were more people there. And by the end of the week, it was really impressive. He wrote a letter to um, his friend, Mrs. Phillips. He said, the meetings have been a success, he says. Listen to this. The young people say they could sit all night. Now, that's something is happening, isn't it? <laughs> the young people say that. Um, there's, there's something that's worth having, something that's worth hearing, something that brings them back to hear more. And after two weeks, um, they had the, 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 a huge meeting of coming together of all those who'd been involved in the previous ones, and the thing took off. This was his sister, Mary. I, I love the way um, brothers talk about sisters. It didn't give her a very good report. She was a sarcastic and peevish girl. That means she was uh, uh, cross, angry, um, and rude. Uh, she's, but she's now had a great change of heart, Evan said. She's happy now. My friends, that may seem a very uh, foolish slide to put up, but I, I find no law against being happy. That if the Lord brings your heart in harmony with his, you're going to be happy. You might go through all sorts of battles, 
but you have a peace inside. And that's one of the things that came out about revival, that everybody who experienced the baptism of the Spirit in the revival, one of the common characteristics was they suddenly knew for the first time that they, they, they had certain salvation, they were sure of it. That's a very, very common testimony. So there we are. So very quickly, the crowds got much too big for the schoolroom and they had to move into the big chapel. Now this is Marah Chapel in Lache as it stands today. Um, and it's been beautifully restored and maintained. And this was the first time Rachel went to it, Rachel and I, a few years ago. It was uh, in the care of Duvry Griffith, the dear man sitting in the pew, the wonderful brother. But this was typical of the pattern of chapels of that time. It's got the, uh, the, the rows of pews down the middle and the side pews, and the gallery is built in the same way. It's got a three-sided gallery at least. Some of them had four-sided gallery. And the sinners used to sit right at the back of the top gallery. That was the traditional. Or I think they could sit at the bottom as well. It was very, very serious business. Now that's the pulpit. Do you know, I, I, I've had the great privilege of preaching from there twice um, with Aja Kim, who probably knows her. Um, who's, she's a Korean musician. And the Koreans come back, you know, they've been back the last couple of years to bring their song back to the place where it started from. But that was Evan Roberts's pulpit. And I've had that great privilege of actually standing in his footprints. Um, do you know, it's something it, you don't realize until you've done it. What happens in these places where the Holy Spirit has been before? The, the, the Holy Spirit comes down so easily again where he's been before. And it's almost as though the bricks of the building, they say, come on, you know, we've heard this before. We know what you're saying. Uh, it's extraordinary things that happened. It, 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 when we went with instruments, um, uh, Aja Kim went with, they had a cellist. And the cellist, who was a very experienced cellist, but she was in the final stages of her learning. Music yeah, yes, music messengers. And, and she was in tears just playing the cello. She didn't know what was coming over her. It was that her cello had never played like that before. And that's, that's the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's ready to come back. Now, immediately, I think this is terrific, the newspapers got hold of the story. Now, the Western Mail was the big newspaper along the south coast of, of Wales. And it came out with this wonderful story about this remarkable religious revival at Lacha and how Mariah Chapel was so full with people, people outside couldn't get in. And, and that's the exact opposite of churches that are always going out trying to fetch people in. Now they, they couldn't keep them out. And um, there were policemen controlling the crowds outside and all this sort of thing. Evan Roberts speaks in Welsh and at the start he doesn't know what he's going to say but the Holy Spirit will speak. And his sermon went on for two hours. That didn't always happen. There wasn't always a sermon at all, actually. Um, but on this occasion, when the press were there, it did. And the vast congregation afterwards remained praying and singing until 2.30 in the morning. Now, my friends, do understand this. The people weren't remaining because the service wouldn't stop. They were, they'd, they'd been free to go home for ages but they did not want to leave the presence of the Lord. That was the reason why they stayed. And when they went outside, they would as often as not go home all the way singing in the streets, singing choruses of praise to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. That has a huge effect on the neighborhood. But I like the bottom paragraph. It says, shopkeepers are closing early to get a place in the chapel. And the tin and steel workers, they would be from um, villages outside crowd the place in their working clothes in other words they weren't going smartly dressed they, they were so keen to get a seat that they went just as they were scruffy in their working clothes and you know the lord doesn't mind how you come dressed it's not that that matters it's the heart mm -hmm. that comes that's what he's looking at and he would forgive the men um, any anything that might have been regarded as a sign of disrespect it wasn't that at all now, Evan Roberts had these four stipulations, and Evan was a very principled man. Um, this is what he said. You've, these are the four things that you must do for the grand blessing to come down, the grand blessing being the Holy Spirit, really. Um, the firstly is confession of past sins, every past sin. 
um, has got to be confessed. All your weakest character spots have got to be confessed. Secondly, anything in your life that's even doubtful, uh, Evan Roberts, he would say, cut it out. He, he was quite radical. If anything that you're not even sure about, whether it's right or wrong, automatically cut it out. Now, I must be honest with you, my, my dear friends, take me as I am. Um, I could never have done that. I knew perfectly well what was going on in my life. And it was bigger than I was. I couldn't do anything about it. And I knew it. Um, so if that was really a prerequisite to coming to salvation, um, I would have never had a chance. I'll come to that again later. But the third thing is total surrender to the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, people, how do you surrender to the Holy Spirit? But I'll tell you this, it all changes at once. When the Holy Spirit comes down mm -hmm. from heaven to earth, the Holy Spirit is present <clears throat> in the place and his, his influence is enormous. And it's, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world when you're in his presence. It's so wonderful. Um, it's just better than anything you've known if your heart is hungry for it. Um, you see, he's our creator. I want to just go back to, to music for a moment, um, prompted by Hugh's singing, and, uh, really. That music can speak. And there is a, a, a thing that I know because my mother was a cellist and she told me this story that if you take a cello, well, there's, there's a regular cello, and uh, you, it's tuned to, 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 uh, to the right pitch. And then you take another cello that's tuned by the same person. Now, you sit behind your cello and the other cello is just propped up against the chair next door. If you play on the bow an open string, that means you're not interfering with the pitch with your fingers, on one cello, the other cello will play the same note without being touched. I bet some of you didn't know that, but it's a wonderful illustration. It won't play so loudly, but what it's doing, it's reverberating its string because it's exactly the same wavelength as the one that's being played with the bow. Now, can I just be silly for a minute, but ask you to imagine yourself as being that cello, the second cello. So you've been played by your master in a symphony orchestra, shall we say, for years. And now for the first time in your life, you've heard yourself make a note that you haven't, that no one has played. It's, it's, just, it's just come out of you. Now, that's an illustration of how it is when your creator, who is the tuner of the cellos, um, comes into your presence, something in you vibrates like crazy. You don't know what it is. It's, it's amazing how you resonate. And you don't have to be a Christian, you see. And this thing can fall upon non-Christians just as easily because non-Christians are just as much made by the living God as we are. Do ponder that, the cello strings. It means a lot to me. I've got a, something on that. It's called a heart string for God, isn't it? Mm. Um, so anyway, total surrender to the Holy Spirit. And then the last of the four things was a public confession of Christ. Um, all these things are really best done out loud. The confession of past sins, the confession, real confession, if it's done out loud, if it's genuine, is amazing. And it, it tends to be very infectious. Other people start confessing as well. And before you know where you are, people are all in tears and confessing things. It's wonderful because it's, the, it's what opens the door. And total surrender to the Holy Spirit, that's easy in his presence, but a public confession of Christ, very important. Jesus died in public in the full view of everybody mm -hmm. for, for us and for our sins. He gave himself utterly in total wretchedness that he was at the time, a terrible situation, absolutely, totally. Come on, what else can we give but our full selves? That's the most wonderful place to be because it's the only place where we'll ever be really fulfilled, being totally given to him, totally taken up by who he is. So this revival got off the ground at jet speed. Um, in the first three months, there were 85,000 people saved. Now, don't forget what I said before. That just is the number of people who were added to church registers who weren't there before. It, it ignores the number of people who were in church already and weren't saved beforehand. 
and he ignores the number of people who came from lots of other churches around the country and from other countries as well uh, who got saved. But that's an indication uh, just for what it's worth. Now, the Welsh, Welsh revival was extraordinary. It wasn't subsidized. Uh, nobody was making money out of it. How unlike so many things that happen today. Um, you know, all these websites, they want you to give and, and you know, it's, one can't give to everybody, but this wasn't like that. There was no effort at, at money raising uh, that I'm aware of. Every church had hymn books, but they weren't used in the revival. There were no hymn numbers put on the wall beforehand. There was no planning whatsoever for the service. There were no song leaders or choirs. They weren't necessary, my friends. The, the human voice should be the voice of the heart, not prescribed, but the voice of the heart. And singing often arose from the congregation. Now, I said there was little planning, that's true. But there's one unsung hero, and I don't remember his name, I'm afraid. Uh, he was a terrific guy who was part of the Evan Roberts team, and other people may have had their own way of doing this. But from Evan Roberts' team, this man used to go out to the towns they'd planned to, to evangelize, and he would suss out the churches, he'd go and visit the churches, and ask each one whether they were interested in having the revival and hosting a revival speaker, because revival was now started and on the move. And, and a lot of them didn't. A lot of them didn't want to know. They'd rather be left alone. But of, of those that did, um, they used to take a team. Uh, Evan Roberts used to have about six preachers, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the number of churches. And he, they would distribute to, to among the churches. And they would never tell anybody which church Evan Roberts was going to. And Evan wanted this kept a secret, but he didn't want people to come to hear him. He wanted people to come and meet with the Holy Spirit. That was how it was with Evan Roberts' team. But I think this guy was, was tremendous, the homework he put into it. But that was all the planning that there was. There was nothing else was necessary. Now, there were no musical instruments, which is, I find that amazing. Because the churches would all have had either a, um, at least a pedal organ, um, one that pump yourself, or they certainly would have had a piano, an upright piano at least, um, by that time. But no musical instruments, as far as I know, were ever used in revival meetings because God loves the sound of the human voice. And it's quite different, isn't it? Today, uh, praise and worship is very easy to get drowned out completely and you can't hear what you're singing. There were very few established preachers, uh, but there were a lot of established preachers who came to see how it was done, but none that were involved um, in, in the revival in, in a big way at all. Um, they ne they nobody ever got invited, I don't think, to speak to an revival. That would speak at revival meetings. That would have been unusual. This is a bit I like. No offerings. Nobody used to pass the plate around for money. Why was that, do you think? It was because the money absolutely poured in. People who weren't Christians were only too pleased to give to the revival in any, whether it was a church or, or what, because they knew in so doing that it was for the good of their own souls. They were supporting something that they knew the world and probably they themselves desperately needed. My goodness, so much of this is the reverse of what we know today, isn't it? So what happened in the service? Well. And Evan Roberts was very, very particular about this, that he, he, he hardly ever prepared a sermon. It was exceptional if ever he did that. He would go to the service waiting for the Holy Spirit to speak. It's got to be led by the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit didn't speak, he wouldn't speak. And, and he, he was very unaccommodating, actually. Um, once he sent an entire congregation home, because the Holy Spirit said these people are at war amongst themselves and they're divided. They're not in a fit state to hear, receive the Holy Spirit or even hear the word. So he discharged the whole congregation and that would be it. Can't do that on Zoom, <laughs> mm -hmm. thank goodness. Um, the, the other thing was that everybody, you couldn't go to a revival service and not be involved in it. It was, it, each revival service was different. Um, it was entirely spontaneous according to how the Holy Spirit led. The singing and prayers were all spontaneous, and most of them came from the congregation. 
Um, somebody would suddenly stand up and sing. And there are lots of examples of that. You're going to love this, getting familiar with what, what happened. The song that Hugh Pride sung was one of the regular ones. It was very often sung. So the, there's all arose from the congregation. Now, there were occasions when Ever Roberts was preaching when the people who were outside because they couldn't get in started singing. And Evan would actually stop the sermon he was preaching and say, I think this is what they're singing outside is what the Holy Spirit wants of us. So he would stop preaching and we the inside in the church, they joined with the singing that was going on outside. Mm -hmm. Do you think very many preachers would do that today? You know, I rather doubt it. So what did Evan Roberts do? Well, if he preached, he preached. If he didn't, he didn't. I want to just tell you a true story of a lady who lives on our, our mountain in front of Echenen. She doesn't, she's still, I don't know, a lady who's dead. Mm. Um, her father, when he was 12, was taken to Liverpool to hear Evan Roberts, when Evan Roberts went to Liverpool. And he, and he remembered this to his dying day, this, this boy. Uh, he was dead by the time his wife told me this story, or Rachel's story. His daughter. And, uh, his daughter, was it? And, and he went, uh, they went to the service of Evan Roberts, and this man, tall man, great presence, went up into the pulpit. And he said to the people that uh, he, was, he wasn't able to speak unless the Lord gave him a word to speak. And there was a tremendous sense of expectation in the place. And they waited for ages, and they kept on hoping. And Evan was standing there just waiting for the Holy Spirit. And it lasted about 30 or 40 minutes. And Evan Roberts said, look, you know, he said, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit hasn't spoken. And that was it. And, and uh, everybody went home. But the, apparently the presence of the man just saying nothing in the church was so immense that the boy never, ever forgot it. They actually went home with holiness, despite the, you know what I mean, they were blessed by the holiness of the man. That's amazing, uh, the power of holiness that a man can carry without saying anything. Now, this was highly unusual that women should play a major role, because in those days, the women were meant to be seen and not heard. Um, they were able to play a supporting role, but the women played an enormous role. And it was all about crying out for forgiveness from the living God and receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to say something here. In general, if you read what really happened in the revival meetings, it wasn't a question as what we so often hear today, uh, Lord, you know, I give my heart to you. It wasn't, it didn't center on the sinner's prayer. It was much more what happened when the Pharisee stood alongside the tax collector in the temple. And the Pharisee extolled himself, but the, the tax collector smote his breast and said, Lord, have mercy upon me, the sinner. And that was the cry of the, of the Welsh revival. It was, Lord, I'm a terrible sinner and there's no hope for me. Please have mercy upon me and give me your Holy Spirit or give me a new heart in Jesus. And that was what it was all about. It's, quite a different sort of ethos. I'm not suggesting, that, suggesting for a minute that a sinner's prayer never works. It depends on the circumstances. It depends entirely uh, on, on the heart of the person. But the other thing that Evan Roberts did in the service, he had an extraordinary prophetic ability. Um, he would sometimes stop what he was doing, uh, preaching or whatever, and he would get one of his team, he would say somebody at the back, to go out into the street and turn right and take the first turning on the left. There's a red letter box on the right-hand side of the road. If you cross over to that, you'll find a, a mother kneeling down beside her pram crying. And he said, you know, re rescue her and bring her in. And this guy would go out of the church and sure enough, there, there it was. And there's no way Evan Roberts could know that from the inside of the church. Uh, occasionally, okay, it, he was wrong, but that was very unusual. But all these guys are human, and they're all learning on their feet, you understand. That was how it was. But anyway, that was, that was so. And he would also attend sometimes individually to people in the church. Sometimes the service broke up as an organized service. service. It was, people were crying out to the Lord in one corner of the church, and 
people around them would gather around and pray them through. And then there'd be a roar of, of thanksgiving up from that corner. But in this corner, somebody else was struggling. And Evan Roberts would often attend to people individually and go around and, and bless them and bring them through. And it was amazing. As the Holy Spirit led, it was a, the spontaneity of it was absolutely wonderful. So here goes a revivalist party from Lacha. One very determined looking man surrounded by five young ladies with big hats. <laughs> But of course, the press did pick this up. I mean, it was a very unorthodox way. No one had ever seen a revivalist adopt this approach. But you see, these women were singers. They had a sense of duty, but they had a sense of passion. Look at them. Mm -hmm. Look what's in their eyes. That's amazing. And they went, and the girl singers are absolutely wonderful. And, and they, look at the singing sisters, and how the big sister takes the two other ones with her. They're, they've got a real destiny and they're fulfilling it. It's absolutely wonderful. Power of singing. And Sam Jenkins, we're actually going to hear Sam um, later on in the presentation. Um, he was a, a tenor singer like Hugh Pridey. And in fact, Hugh Pridey has given us the clip we're going to play later on. He used to go around with Sidney Evans. That was um, Evan Roberts' roommate. And, uh, and he and Sam singing. They're holding up their Bibles. They used to follow up the revival, go around the places where the revival had been preached and reignite the fire together. And we've sung Here is Love. Now, Here is Love was sung magically by this lady. What a beautiful face that is. This was Annie Davis from My Steg. But Evan Roberts didn't know who she was and um, had never seen her before. But in one of his meetings, this, this pretty lady, she's a lovely, lovely face. She got up and began to sing Here is Love in Welsh, exactly the same song that you've just heard Hugh Pride sing. And she couldn't finish it, my friends. She broke down in tears in the second verse and couldn't complete it. It meant so much to her because she had, she had been kissed with that kiss of love by the Holy Spirit. And, and that, was, that was how it was. Now, as soon as the service was over, Evan went up to her, found her out in the crowd. And he said, I don't know who you are. But he said, please. He said, wherever I go and speak, he said, will you please come with me and be with me to sing? And you know, she did. She was faithful to that. Um, as far as the records show, she went and, and people were saved because of her singing. It's a tremendously powerful thing. Rachel and I used to, we had a, a period of giving revival meetings, didn't we? Mm. In the upper room of the town hall, actually. And it used to attract about 40 or 50 people. And we had a lovely little singer. She was absolutely sweet. Um, she's a lady called Pat, and she was in her 70s, I should think. Mm. She was once opera trained. And we and she agreed, if, if it was right on the night, she would sing out of the audience. And I remember coming to this slide, and, she, and we had a sign language together, and she would get up and sing. And, and Pat, she used to sing straight up to heaven. Mm. She didn't sing to the audience at all. She was singing straight up to heaven. It was amazing. And I used to have to turn my back on the people. <laughs> I couldn't help it. it used to, I was in tears every single time. And, and, it, and so was the audience. It was amazing, wasn't mm. it? Wrong, yeah. The power of music with, um, really was amazing. Mm. Anyway, let's get back to the PowerPoint. Now, we all know about the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is the Great Commission. Nothing, I, you know, but the fact is, it fulfilled itself. It was the joy of, of experiencing real salvation. It just couldn't be kept in mm. by the believers. And every mine, tram car, office, school, and shop, it, everything became a pulpit for the gospel. And that's written by Rick Joyner, who's not a noted historian. Um, but Rick certainly got the message of the Welsh Revival. And I sent him a little book of what, what happened in Clamalek, and I remember mm. he, was, he was thrilled to bits with that. So what happened next? Well, my friends, is everybody still gripping their seat? Mm -hmm. Revival spread across rails, and it did this in a very unusual way. It was the Lord seemed to spread it right across rails, like a carpet unfolds. Uh, it, covered, it covered almost all the land. And extra, extraordinarily... Um, revival was just about to break out. Every time the revival party got to it, it was, it was absolutely ripe for what was going to happen. It was 
are very impressive. It also spilled over into England. And you're going to see that partly tomorrow. Uh, it's, it went overflowed from North Wales into England because uh, they got there before England did. And there's no, that was it, sweet. It, it, it worked in England as well. It doesn't only confine itself to, to a favorite country. And in all these places, it produced a huge moral reform. The morality of society just changed. And other preachers came to see how it was done. Now, when they did, uh, they, they, no doubt a lot of the preachers came to think they might be able to have a, a helping hand in it. But once they saw what was going on, they had never, ever seen anything like it before. And instead of coming to take a leading role, as maybe some of them secretly hoped they would, and they, they just found they didn't know what on earth to say. They had nothing to add. And there's a, a wonderful story about this. There's, I love this. Uh, I told it, actually, in Mariah Chapel. There was, there was one chapel. I think he was from a foreign country, but I don't know whether that was, that was so, but he was from another church. And he came out to Evan Roberts after one of the, the meetings, and he absolutely beseeched him. He said, Mr. Roberts, he said, I'm about to go back to my own church. He said, please, 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 he said, will you tell me before I go? He said, what is your secret? And Evan Roberts, who was a man of few words and no unnecessary words, he looked down at him, I'm sure, with loving kindness. He said, we have no secret. He said, just ask. Amen. Mm. Well, the sense of the Lord's presence was everywhere. And this is uh, written by R.B. Jones, who you saw earlier. He was the young man who wanted, wanted the, the, uh, the special meeting for jaded pastors the most. We'll see him tomorrow. And he quotes this from his, the book that he wrote later, that the Lord's presence was everywhere. It was obviously, it was in the revival meetings, but it wasn't confined to them. It was in the homes, on the streets in the mines, the factories, the schools, and even in the theatres and drinking saloons. They were the dens of sin. The theatres were probably, um, you know, like, probably had strip tees and stuff like that. I don't know. They were obviously immoral. And the, the drinking saloons, that was the target um, to get around to the... But you see, in the coal mines, they, they had these meetings in the lunch break. They had a one-hour lunch break. They used to bring their sandwiches um, with them. And generally speaking... Um, they would just chat, I think, but now they were having revival meetings. They didn't call them that. They, they were just meeting together um, to share the word of God because the Lord was in the place. And there, there were no ministers or, or, you know, vicars or anybody down there. And they just, somebody would be reading the Bible. All they had was the light of the Humphrey Davy safety lamps they used to have, uh, which were supposed to be safe in gaseous situations. And, you know, one of the, the blokes would just be reading the Bible and there was conviction, people crying out for forgiveness right the way around. And this was how it was. Um, we had some extraordinary stories of deliverance down the coal mines. Um, amazing. And, and, you know, they went on, they, the revival meeting stopped on time. They got on with the afternoon work. But my goodness me, each day was a new day in the mines. And these guys were rough, you know, they were absolutely... The last sort of people you'd expect to come to Jesus. Why are our expectations like that? We need to change our mindsets. This happened all over Wales. There were lots of open air meetings. I haven't the time to show all of them. I haven't even got all of them. But this is a, a particular example out of the book I showed you earlier. Evan Roberts is actually blessed by a, a covering and his team. And perhaps there's some singers there. I don't know. But there's, it's raining on the crowd. And you can see the umbrellas up. And this is January 1905, when winters were a lot colder than they are now. And there were 92 people that came forward for baptism as a result of that meeting. And this is, the next slide is amazing. They were all baptized. It's near Clonechli, this took place. They were all baptized that day in the same uh, piece of water by the same um, pre, uh, pastor and I think that pastor should be in the Guinness Book of Records if anybody knows the Guinness Book of Records I mean, to, to baptise 92 people straight off or one man and, and how, how they did it uh, actually they had, they had wellingtons on, sort of fishermen's wellingtons and they were kind of rubber welded to um, 
a sort of like a diver might wear below the waist. So he could go up to his waist in theory without getting wet, but I bet the boots leaked. So what were the effects of the revival? What happened in revival meetings? It was amazing what happened because it wasn't planned. It wasn't declared. It was just what happened naturally when the Holy Spirit came down. Whether you were a Baptist, a Methodist, didn't matter anymore. The interdenominational barriers were, were nothing compared with what the blessing was that was coming down. They were united in what the Lord was giving them. And an even bigger thing, the Welsh-English language divide. I mean, that's a big issue. You know, I've said that earlier. Um, that just didn't matter. And Evan Roberts was known to speak in English once. He gave a complete service in Bristol in England. And, and there was no offense at all if an Englishman came up with a prayer because it was the only language he knew. It didn't matter. People would, would praise the Lord and amen. But it was the language of the spirit was, was, was predominant. Industrial unrest, there was lots of that in the mines. Uh, that, was, that was settled, the hatred between miners and their bosses. And family feuds, feuds between families, that means enmity between families, was, were healed. And people just became kinder. Their kindness just fell upon the people. People would pray debts, long-term debts um, that they owed, and they'd do all sorts of things they'd never done before. Have I got, oh yes, I mustn't, I mustn't, that nearly, I nearly lost that. You see the slide at the bottom right there. The ponies, poor, poor ponies. Mm. The ponies hardly saw the light of day. They spent their life down the mines and being sworn at and kicked. Uh, and they only responded to brutality. Now, I can't tell you that the ponies got born again, obviously, but uh, they had to learn a new way. The kindness of the miners was a completely different. They didn't, there was no more bad language, no more violence. But once the ponies got used to their new, their new lives of the bosses, they were tremendous. And productivity in the mines went up. It didn't go down. Um, it was an amazing um, message. Now, the children and parents, that was a big thing. The, they were reunited. Family, feuds within the family, they were reunited. And there was a huge reduction in drinking. And there was also a huge fall in the crime rate. And long-term debts got settled. And people did things like getting together um, to save up money, to buy somebody back out of a workhouse. Because that's what happened in those days. If you couldn't pay your debts, you were put into a, a workhouse uh, for the rest of your life. You wouldn't have a chance of, of repaying the debt. And other people used to get together sometimes and repay debts that didn't even belong to them. Now, the newspapers were interesting. And we're very wary of the press today, rightly, because our modern-day press, generally speaking, is, is anti um, Christianity, there's, there's exceptions to that, of course. But in those days, the press didn't dare be against Evan Roberts because he was so popular. I better just go back to that slide. Um, so the, the, the press did uh, pu publicize the meetings. That was good. And people used to buy the press to find out how many people were saved the night before in their village. They used to run special revival editions. Isn't that amazing? Now, the um, Calvinistic Methodists insisted that Evan ought to go to Liverpool. And in a way, this was a turning point in Evan's ministry, um, although really the turning point had begun earlier. I'll come back to that. But um, the 28th of March to the 17th of April is when he went to Liverpool. And he went with a big team of organisers from the um, Calvinistic Methodist Mission it's called the Liverpool Mission. And those were the officers on the left of the committee, and Evan, of course, is in the middle. And Evan dreaded going to Liverpool. He, he felt out of his place leaving uh, Wales at that time. He hadn't done it before. And he had a good reception. There were 100,000 Welsh people waiting for him. Now, those people had probably, a lot of them, they were Welsh speakers, and they were most of them probably were um, working in Wales previously, but when employment fell short in Wales, as it did, uh, coal mining came and went. There were times when there was more demand for it than others. Same with all the other mining industries. Slate was the same and granite was the same um, in our village here. 
Um, so they used to try and find work somewhere else, and Liverpool was the nearest big city to North Wales. So a lot of people there were actually already saved in the North Wales uh, part of the revival, which we'll talk about tomorrow. But anyway, he had a very good civic reception. The mayor gave him a full honours. But you see, Evan Roberts wasn't interested in honours. He, he thanked the mayor for it. He didn't spurn it. But he said all that mattered, he said, was his, his, the one that he wanted was the honour of being able to preach the kingdom of God and to be received for who his, what his ministry was. But inevitably, the meetings were more organised and they really weren't very successful. This, uh, and that was very disappointing for Evan. And Evan was inside Evan. He was a very sensitive man. And it would have accused him that the meetings were less successful. Now, th there are various reasons for why that was. <laughs> um, Evan, because of his principles, refused to preach anywhere that wasn't a consecrated premises. And in actual fact, there had been some very big missions um, in Liverpool. Um, I, I think I can remember the Tory and Sankey and people like that, I think. They'd, they'd had huge tent missions. Um, and that was that was quite the done thing to have. You know, a, a really big mission would be in a tent, not in a building. And the other things was that there was a, a bit of a split going on um, in in Liverpool between the different congregations. There was a split actually in the Methodist Church, the Calvinist Methodist Church. And Evan denounced this as being the devil, which probably he may be right, but it didn't make friends with anybody. Um, and the other thing was that most people who came to hear Evan Roberts, they came to hear him rather than meet with the Holy Spirit, uh, because he was by this time a very well-known name. Now, this uh, is a turning point where he went to North Wales. And that was also something that he was urged to do. And he, di he didn't look forward to that either, because uh, there was a big language difference, really, between Welsh spoken in the north and the south, both in meaning and pronunciation. But anyway, Evan was prevailed to go, and he was supposed to have a short holiday there, a couple of weeks, I think it was supposed to have been. And this, my friends, is a, a, one of, a famous station. I suggest you all watch the screen. Don't miss this, because uh, you'll regret it if you do. This is a station with the longest name, a name so long it was longer than the train. Here it comes. Okay. Any volunteers? <laughs> uh, that's, it's actually, of course, it means something in Welsh. Cranvar Pufgwin Gigoch Gel Hurren Drobuch and Asilio Gogogoch. And that was actually um, the whole original station has gone to America. They, they bought it up lock, stock and barrel mm. somewhere. I don't know where it was. So I, I thought you'd quite like that. Well, anyway, something was wrong. And Evan, when he came to North Wales, really had what we would look upon as a, a nervous breakdown, I think. That's not putting it too strongly. Um, he was only supposed to be a couple of weeks, but then eventually it stretched to six. And there was nobody up here who was really able to advise him. Um, he tended to isolate. And the message that went back to South Wales was that he'd lost half his brain. Medical description was very... Um, rudimentary in those days um, and it, it wasn't it wasn't really that but I think he was suffering a, a reaction from all that he'd done and he'd absolutely given himself utterly and he did preach in Anglesey between uh, for six weeks between June and July and a Carnarvon a town in the mainland and a lot of the meetings were open air meetings and this was one that he did in an open place. There were 3,000 people crammed into this, um, a pulpit that had been used in the old days by John Elias. There were lots of those around in North Wales. This was the last meeting he ever gave on Anglesey, at least. I don't, I, that's not quite correct, but it, it, he, it was the last meeting that he gave in this um, bunch of meetings. Look at the people all standing out there. And have you ever thought how loud their voices must have been? because they didn't have amplified sound, did they, in those days? Well, what happened to Evan Roberts? This is a very dangerous place to be. This is, if you went on holiday in North Wales, this is the kind of postcard you might well send back to your friends back home. Here's the revivalist, you know, holding up a hand in triumph and the word of God in the other hand. But you're very exposed in a situation like that. There were lots of, of newspaper reports about him, of course. 
and um, there are also attacks from within the churches themselves. Those are the most hurtful. We'll come to that in a minute. But the newspapers used to use a lot of these line drawings because photography was fairly new on the scene and it was more expensive to reproduce than, than these drawings. And the drawings around the edge are fairly typical of, of what people used to pray. God save my father and mother and throw out the lifeline and God save everybody in this valley, you know, wonderfully optimistic prayers and really, really with a loud voice of wails behind them. But the middle picture portrays the hostile press reaction where Evan Roberts was also portrayed as an aggressive preacher. Those who are not with me, heart and soul are against me. Now he may, he may have said that, but he wasn't there to be intimidating. He, and that wouldn't have been his expression, but he was there to be emphatic. He spoke the truth straight, fearlessly as it was. But the real hurt came against him with a vicious attack on his character from um, a, a Baptist minister who had a, a flourishing church, actually. He had a congregation of 1,000 uh, in the Merthyr Tidville er era. And he accused uh, Evan Roberts of being a false revival and that his revival was the real one. Now, I don't know very much about this man, except I have met somebody who actually knew him. Um, but I think he was a hellfire preacher, uh, maybe how he filled his church uh, with threats. He, uh, he was very aggressive to Evan Roberts. But what he was really upset about was that Evan had no training. Uh, he was untrained. And the fact that the Lord was capable of raising a man with no training compared with all his credentials that Peter Price claimed to have was what cut him. And Evan read what he said in the papers. He never, ever replied to it, which I think was the right thing to do. Uh, he never replied, uh, but he was grieved in his heart. And he was always cautious after, that was February in 1905 that that started. And it put Evan Roberts somewhat on the defensive. But his exhaustion got worse after he got home. And it came to a head, sadly, in 1906. He was completely exhausted and taken into care. Now, there was no official way of being taken into care in those days, but he was taken into care by um, this Mrs. Penn Lewis. And we're going to deal with that story tomorrow. Um, she gave him residence uh, in her home, um, and that's where he spent the next few years, and not any longer in the revival. She took him out of it, in fact. She wanted him partly to be a co-author for her book, War on the Saints. Now, that was Jesse Penn Lewis's ambition, um, but he had no fellowship at all with what she was saying in the book. He knew it was nothing to do with the revival, nothing to do with what God had brought him towards, um, and no doubt it came against him massively. We'll go into that in greater detail tomorrow. But he didn't really recover. He was, he was out of, completely out of it. Um, up in his room, he locked himself away. He wouldn't meet anybody. Um, I, I don't know how he, he managed. I just don't know. But he, his father and Dan came up to, to plead to see him. And the Penn Robertses were very pleased for to get him to go up. They thought maybe they might bring him out of the room, but it didn't work. Um, he wouldn't come out even for them. Do you know, my friends, he was so disheartened. He was so troubled. What might it have been like if I'd not done this and if I'd instead done that? Can you imagine that? I can, as a revivalist. Because revival is not always received by the churches. The total victory that you foresee, it doesn't always happen like that. There was resistance to it. And, and you know, he had to um, live through that and come out the other side, which I'm sure he did. He never lost his faith. In the early 20s, he moved into England, which was a very unlikely move. And in the late 1920s, he returned to Cardiff. And actually, in the very late 1920s, he did come back to Lacha. And we know that he underwent a series of meetings teaching the locals what it would involve, trying to provoke a second revival. And we don't know again what he actually said, but um, it was good. It was inspiring stuff, but it didn't come to anything very much. He never got married. Here's a picture of him in his old age. He lived to the age of 72. And this was the memorial that was, that was 
um, made for him outside. This is outside Marah Chapel. Now, you've heard about Sam Jenkins. We've mentioned him as a tenor singer who was a revival singer and he sang mightily. Now, he was actually present um, for the BBC um, when this statue was unveiled. It's the memorial of Evan Roberts. And so his uh, voice was actually recorded by the BBC. And um, Hugh Pride, I'm very grateful to him. He's provided the link, which we're going to play to you right now. Now, listen to this. This is a man who bellows from his heart. Amazing. Um, now, there's a picture of Sam Jenkins. He was a friend with Evan Roberts, and that's a picture of Evan Roberts in his old age on the left. And that, that's Sam Jenkins. And do you know, very sadly, that was the last time Sam Jenkins ever sang, as far as we know. Um, he went up to, uh, to Rill for some form of uh, convention up there, and he, I don't think he sang again. But what an amazing voice and what a legacy he left behind. And of course, Evan Roberts himself left a legacy. While I was there, I couldn't help praying at his graveside. Evan Roberts temperamentally was so different. I, I, we're so different as people, but I, the Lord had given me such an understanding of Evan Roberts. I really felt I knew and understood him in a way I could never ever have done just by reading the books. And sure enough, when I came to his grave, it was a deeply moving thing. And the rest of his family, a large, large number of them are in that same graveyard. And this was what Evan Roberts said. My mission is first to the churches. And that's terribly important because he knew that the weak church is a real, what the Lord really comes to revive. It's when the church is weak, people look to the church, they see nothing. But when the churches wake up to their duty, that's what, how he puts it, men of the world will be swept into the kingdom. And you saw them swept, didn't you? How they, they swept in through the doors. There were people outside, um, policemen controlling the crowds. A whole church, Evan says, on its knees is irresistible, particularly if it's in repentance. In Wales, 100,000 people again were saved, and that is the numbers that were actually added to the church registers. But there were, there were thousands and probably millions indirectly outside who found it. They, they reckon the figure of 250,000 is an, a, an un, a likely estimate of the kind of numbers that were actually saved by direct contact with Evan Roberts and the revival ministry that he, he spearheaded. And there were other uh, people involved in this as well. But Evan said, I have found what is to my belief the highest kind of Christianity. My desire is to give my life, which is all I have to give, to helping others find it also. Many have already found it, thank God, and many more are finding it through them. And that is true because the revival fire was literally what it said, and it did spread around the world. All five continents were affected. Azusa Street Revival was directly spawned from the Welsh Revival. In fact, Evan Roberts was approached um, by one of the leaders out there and gave his full advice to the Azusa Street. And Azusa Street was a bigger revival uh, than, than the Welsh Revival in terms of its locality. But I know Jesus still loves the Welsh Revival. 
India was swept with a fire, especially in the south of India. A huge number of missionaries went out there, um, including, of course, uh, Dan and, and um, no, it was his roommate, it wasn't, and, and Mary, I think they went out there. Britain and Central Europe were, were involved. The church is founded in Scandinavia, and there were missions to Africa and Asia. And of course, Eastern Europe was involved, and the Far East, the Pyongyang revival um, in the South Korea was where Korea got its Christianity from. And that's why Koreans come back. We had regularly come back um, from, to see Mara Chapel has a stream of visitors who come to visit it because they know that was the epicenter, if you like, of where revival went out from. Now these are just my concluding quotes and they're written by R.B. Jones. You're going to meet him tomorrow. Exciting day tomorrow, quite different from today. The revival revealed an ideal of Christian living. Now he's talking about morals, the morality of Christian living, which was way and above on a different level it was miles higher than the level of what he calls dead morality that ordinarily satisfies even those who profess to be born again now what he's actually saying is it's terribly unfortunate that christians expect to go through life dragging all their sins with them they don't expect anything better mm -hmm. and 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 that's why you know they just go on they think this is the christian life and you know we go along i'm going to speak to that again tomorrow in much more detail but um the dead morality is a terrible thing because sin doesn't matter. You do some good deeds and that's, that's all that counts. That's not what Jesus died for. R.B. Jones came to learn that and so did Evan Roberts. Now those who'd long been, they'd been in churches for years, they suddenly discovered that they had no living experience themselves of what salvation was. They didn't know it until they saw it coming down from heaven to earth. And when it did, they went forward with the rest, humbly finding their way to the cross. And you know, the pastors had to do that too. They were in need of salvation, just as much as their congregation. That was very, very common. And one reason, of course, why the pastors resisted revival. And we'll come across that story on Sunday, particularly. My friends, I just want to thank you so much for listening. Um, you've been, I'm going to say, a pleasure to talk to you. You've been just wonderful. Uh, I just hope you take home something really special from this into your hearts. Very often when the Lord speaks, he likes you to take it to your place of prayer, just you and him together. And if you really seek him for something better than what you've got now, just bring yourself to him as you really are, because that begins to turn the key from where salvation comes from. And he is waiting to listen to you. Bless you. Amen. And praise the Lord. Absolutely. For his blessings. So without Absolutely. number. And yes, and my, my dear prompter. <laughs> she's, she's here. And coffee maker. And, and coffee maker, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye, mm. everybody. Thank you so much, Richard. Before we close, we'd like to thank so much the uh, the referral that we had through Reverend Tess and Bishop Michael there in Cairns. And uh, also before we uh, go off the air, so to speak, we'd like to pray for all those that are listening in. And um, if you are listening in from wherever you are, if you're in Singapore, can you please put in the chat box the town where you are in Singapore so we can play pray for you, the regional center, the town. If you are from overseas, could you please put your province, the capital uh, of that particular pro provincial capital or town, please, could you do that right now so that we can pray uh, that by the end of this series that we are having today uh, is part one. Tomorrow we are putting... Uh, part uh, two, and then on Sunday, we are going to put part three. And in other words, that God would give you a signal. If you are from a foreign country, 
tell us the not only the city but what is the country the nearest capital or the airport where where uh, the planes land and we will pray for you as representative a watch person over that area it could be a particular concern that you have a block of flats or a corner coffee shop that the lord is drawing you into that place where you have morning coffee uh, it could be a spe specific school or a specific uh, class within a school uh, where your children are assigned some place which is uh, an office or a business that you are drawn to pastor uh, in the marketplace from monday to friday it could be your family or a specific person or a couple that's going through some troubled times. Um, revival is not tomorrow. It's not yesterday, but it's also going to be right now. We're going to pray. We're going to send the angels that by the end of the third day, we are going to see uh, his, the dispatch of the help from the Ebenezer, uh, the Ezer, the, who is our, our Eliezer, our God, who is our helper. And uh, if there is someone sick, that uh, the angels will be sent bedside. We, we would like to make aware that this series on Mods TV is a very young, and uh, we're still in our not even born stage, we're still in the fetal stage, 12 weeks only of the 40 weeks. And uh, we believe that uh, all those responsible for the, uh, the prayer and the, the support of this ministry, this media ministry, when it uh, grows up, it will also have miracles and signs and wonders. For now, what we can do is we can pray right where we are, we can agree with your faith, for, uh, and we can combine our faith with your faith for the complete resolution of whatever that you are praying and crying out to God for. Because each of you came to this program for a specific purpose, an assignment that God has laid, a burden that God has laid upon your heart. And you've already come too far and you've done too much to give up now and to turn back now. You can only go forward. So Amen. whatever you write down now, we are agreeing for God. And um, for Mods TV as a special Christmas gift, we are also going to uh, give to the Lord a complete uh, renovation of the na National Capital Region of the Philippines and uh, from uh, Bulacan in the north to Cavite in the south. This is representative of 23 million handsets, 23 mi million subscribers on the handphone that can listen to re uh, recordings like this and, this, uh, and live, live presentations like this of the gospel being preached that will cut across denominational lines. So I don't know what your dream is, but let's have big dreams, shall we? Let's have big dreams. Let's not just have, uh, you know, uh, dreams that are in, 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 you know, let's not dream any small dreams here. Because the, the, the men and the women who have uh, blazed the trail for us as what uh, Richard and uh, Rachel and uh, all of the pioneers, even I'm so blessed my spiritual father is on this program. The same guy who baptized me in the summer of 1980, right, mm -hmm. Pastor Michael, is the same guy in 2001 who delivered the bishop's charge over my life in my ordination. It's the same guy who's now in partnership with us as a result of this. And uh, we are so blessed so what is your dream? Perhaps it, it begins as a seed, but it will not be just the seed of the woman. It will grow into a large tree. So let's not dream any you know, small dreams here. Because when we combine, it says when one of us can take a thousand, 
but two of us can take, not 2,000, but 10,000. And mm -hmm. how many people, I think the latest count, I don't know how many people we have on, on here in this place, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read out these places, and you are going to be so amazed, okay? The German Hessen, capital Hessen, Frankfurt, all right. Street evangelism, revival, nearby city of Limburg, consider it done. Dorothea, consider, consider it done. I'm so excited. Let's go up on that thing there. What else do we have? Alimbuyao, Baguio City for Becky. Amen. We're combining our faith. San Leonardo, Nueva Ecija, Philippines. Marikina, Gulod, Malaya, San Mateo, Rizal for Tracy. And uh, Neziel and uh, Fernando, Kamuning, Kizon City. When we say city, you're talking about maybe three or four or five or six amokyos, the size of Tampanese combined. In, in the NCR region itself is something like 12 Singapore's, all right? So Rosabel, Ebenezer, Reiki, River of God, Ali, Ali Tag Tag, and Galleria, all right. Jenalyn, Rosero, Kalaokan, Philippines. Okay, Kalaokan. Benedict, Kota, Kineng, Kinengao, Sabah, Malaysia, and Baguio City. All right, David, Tampanese. All right, uh, Jenna Lin, Hong Kong, jubilant place, Kowloon. All right, Jenny Hui, uh, Hu, Hu Ye. All right, hallelujah. Isabel Garland, Baguio City. Mm -hmm. Valenzuela for Daisy Macayayo. Lindell, San Dionisio, Ilo Ilo, but Das Marinas Cavite and Ortigas, and Pasig, all right? Another, Tampanese for David. Evelyn Eng, Bukit Batok. Marilau, Bulacan. Queenstown, Jill Lok. Folks, if you combine your faith right now, this is it. This is where the angels will be sent. They have been in re repose for too long. They have been in retirement for too long. We'll send them out to Fairview, Kizon City, on behalf of Pierre, Estolas, Manga, Tarem, Pangasinan, Gertrude, Catalan, Marakina, Metro, Manila, Julius. For Jing, is Kizon City, Metro Manila. For Jenny, New Upper Changi Road, in Jesus' name, Dover. For Estelle, for Stell. For Mr. Lim, Haogang Avenue 1. You're going to see the change. For Ike Seng, UT. For Saran Singh, New Delhi, India. Jing, again, Ali Tag Tag. For Joyce, Tampanese. For uh, uh, Dean Mok, is Jurong West. For Jay Zane, is Bukit Panjang. For Rosabel is Pasik City. Jeffrey is Katong, Siglap, Marine Parade. Potong Pasir for Gordon Go. For, uh, T, uh, for Pauline, Holland Village. Tisa, Kiambo, Marilau, Bulacan. All right. Evelyn Eng, West Region, Singapore. Brian Henson, Valenzuela City. Israel Chai is Seng Kang, Elsie, Tampanese. Amen. Amen. And so much more. Put your name, put your city and your town or your province. Are there any more there? We're going to agree with you. Amen. Agree with you. Iris Liu, Central Topayo, East, West, North, and South. She wants everybody in her, her neighborhood. Amen. God can do it and will do it. Lindell, Barok Tak, Nuevo, Iloilo, Escalante, Negros, Occidental. Amen. So be it. Uh, 
New Jer Jersey, Los Angeles, USA, Sydney. Why not? Northern Samar for the Samaritans. Amen. Hallelujah. Joyce, yep. Woodlands. Jenny Hui Yui is Hague Road. What you put there, God is watching. God covenants with you now. As you listen, these are not just stories of God does not live in the past. He's not a God of the past. He is the God of the present. He has that advantage over us. We are finite. We only live in a window of time. But he knows what you write there, whatever you write there. In fact, one of you are you're writing an important city, New York. That's an important city in revival in the last days, as you can see from tomorrow's lecture and on, th on uh, Sunday, Sunday's lecture as well. Baguio City. My whole body is shaking right now. I can, yeah. I can sense God is answering your, he is going, he's sending, he already, whenever God says, I will provide, that means he already has the solution in the, the answer is in the house. The answer is already there. Cebu City for Sarawak. Uh, Upper Serangoon Avenue. Amen. USA. Upper Serangoon Avenue. Paseris. Amen. Reese Beach. That's right. Palawan. Dalasio Liga. Palawan. My goodness. Hallelujah. Even companies, Cha Cha Chaco, Glory, Iris Liu, Admiralty, Singapore. We're going to close at this time. But God is totally serious Amen. that He will have His way through your prayers. And it 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 is completely free of charge it's completely all you we need to do is agree with the faith and combine our faith for these locations today and we will do this tomorrow and every day that we hear this message because god is the god of today yes and faith is now now faith is ortigas central business cbd amen Changi Amen. prisons. Amen. 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 It will happen. It will turn around. The turnaround has begun when we speak the same thing as what God is speaking to you right now. Yes, Homologia. Yes. We are renewing our mind. We are aligning our purpose and our end for what God has in store. The good thing that God has in store. For the foreign workers. Mekayuan Bulakan. Amen. Amen. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people Amen. coming in because of your prayer, because of your steadfastness. You're already going through, the world is already going through hell. We might as well have revival through this, this time. We might as well. We're going, so many people are suffering in the world because of this thing. We might as well have revival. We might as well ask. We might as well believe. Philippine Stock Exchange Center, why not? East and West Towers. We don't know what, how he will answer our prayers. We don't know how he will answer our prayers, but God will answer our prayers. And we're very, very mindful also. Whenever we pray for a place, the way he answers may not be to our expectation. Mm -hmm. Fulton Street Revival in New York, Wall Street. How many hundreds, hundreds of thousands of men, thousands of men came to the Lord. And it was just in the nick of time before the 18, uh, 1863 Civil War. The men were saved. Before they, went, before they died in that civil war. So we don't know how God answers or why he answers. It's beyond, but we trust that he answer, his answer is always the best answer for, for the world. Whatever lies ahead, whatever is ahead, 
Thank you so much for your participation in this prayer. And uh, we will remain, uh, and I'll ask the bishop to close us. Uh, we will remain un unshaken and unafraid and unashamed. And uh, let's remember the words of uh, the apostle uh, Paul who said to the, uh, to the jailer, uh, Philippian jailer, do thyself no harm for we are all here and we shall be here again tomorrow at 4 p.m. with Brother Richard. Okay, Bishop Michael, can you uh, close us for this session? Thank you, Lord, for, um, for the research that Richard, assisted by Rachel, has put into this. It's been a great blessing. And uh, we take inspiration from the stories of revival. And we say, Lord, do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, as we are even closer now to your coming, closer to the edge of the millennium, Lord, inspire us and do it again in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.